Thank you so much for taking your time to be here this evening with us. My name is Christina Olstead, and I serve as the Dean of Students. The University of Wisconsin-Madison is committed to freedom of speech and freedom of expression as an essential part of our educational mission. In the spirit of our dedication to the free exchange of ideas, we are here tonight to hear the scheduled speaker and then to engage in a question and answer. It's our expectation that you allow the speaker's presentation and subsequent question answer exchanges to occur without disruption. Any disruptions to this event will be handled swiftly. Now I have the honor of turning it over to Paula to work on some audience introductions. Give Paula a warm welcome. Is this good? Okay. We wanted to do something a little different tonight. We wanted the audience to get to know each other a little bit better. So you will find on your chairs the slips of colored paper. And we're asking that you um, find a partner with the same color paper. And then that will be your partner for the evening in terms of sharing. And to start off with, I'll wait for everyone. Has everyone found somebody with the same color paper? Piece of paper? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, if, if for some reason you don't find some of the same color paper, you can find another orphan or singleton and join with them, or you could join a couple and form a threesome. Okay. So, we'd like you, we'd like you to um, say your name, uh, where you're from, and what you hope to get out of this evening's presentation. Your name, where you're from, and what you hope to get out of this event. Okay, and you have six minutes, three minutes per person.
have about 30 seconds left, so let's try to wrap up our sharing. Okay, are you? Might want to finish your sentence, but no new sentences. Um, oh, thank you. Um, well, just check my my watch, and we're already running behind. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ulrich Rosenhagen. I'm the interim director of the Center for Interfaith Dialogue at UW Medicine. I want to welcome you here at Trip Commons, wherever you are using our live stream. Tonight's event, The Power and Promise of Nonviolent Action, is based on a cooperation between the Center, UW Medicine's Nonviolence Project, and the Interfaith Peace Working Group here in Madison. I want to thank the Dean of Students, Dr. Christina Olstadt, who reminded us of the free speech guidelines at our university, and Paula, I think it's pronounced Roggi, oh, one of the members of the Peace Working Group who encouraged us to get to know the people sitting next to you. Although recent events in the Middle East make it seem as if this event was organized in, re in direct response, that is not so. We started to plan tonight's event already in July. Center had just reorganized under student affairs when Jerry Folk, where's Jerry? Oh, he's, oh, okay. When Jerry Folk from the Peace Working Group and I started to think out loud about common interests and, dis and, dis and discussed collaborating on important conversations. Professor Mo Banerjee and the Nonviolence Project joined us shortly thereafter. When we planned this event, we had the war between the Ukraine and Russia on our minds and the increasingly uncivilized ways in which people in the US act and engage, not only over social media. We thought about opening a space to explore alternative ways to engage with each other as citizens and to talk about our religious and non-religious core convictions. We soon decided to invite Dr. Maria Stefan. No, sorry, I mispronounced it. You just told me don't pronounce it. Stefan, no, I can't. It's so, <laughs> I just, I, um, yeah, as an excellent speaker to kick off the conversation. At this point, I need to make a confession. I'm afraid I'm somewhat responsible for the event poster you see here on the screens. Um, yeah, I see my fellows smiling. They, they know exactly where I'm going with this. I was the one who wanted that muscular figure in the midst of the poster. Interfaith fellows of the center didn't really know what to make of it. In fact, my fellows told me last week they weren't enthused about the poster and especially didn't like that dominating figure in the middle. So I feel I owe them some explaining. The sculpture in the back depicts a man hammering a sword into a plow chair can be found at the site of the United Nations in New York City. The Soviet Union gifted it in 1959 to the United Nations. So this perhaps explains my fellow's dislike, the aesthetic sensibilities of the 1950s Soviet Union and of today's American undergraduates don't match up. The sculpture de depicts a biblical scene envisioned by the biblical the scene envisioned by the biblical prophets Micah, Isaiah, and Joel. Each of these three prophets wrote, quote, 
They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. End quote. These prophets foretold a reign of peace when instruments of violence and destruction would be molded into instruments of peace and flourishing. The sculpture and its biblical context is of particular importance for the recent history of my home country, Germany. Forty years ago, in a public performance in Wittenberg in East Germany, that's on the other side of the wall, a renitent Lutheran pastor of the name Friedrich Schorlemmer took a hammer and a sword and with repeated blows to the metal, forged it into a plowshare. Historians of contemporary Germany consider this performance 40 years ago the beginning of the peaceful revolution in East Germany that climaxed in the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Well, the sculpture not only depicts the utopian prophetic potential that rejects violence as a means of engagement, it is also a deep symbol to remind everyone of the power and promise of nonviolent action that, in the long run, can lead to tearing down walls. I recognize the same utopian potential in the title of tonight's talk, The Power and Promise of Nonviolent Action. Nonviolent action may seem lofty at the beginning, but watch out. Sometimes when it, when it unleashes its potentials, it can change history. Thus, tonight we want to hear more about nonviolent action as a different way to negotiate disagreements. Tonight's talk is supposed, supposed to open a space for conversation. Directing us towards that space is Dr. Maria Stefan. Dr. Stefan is a political scientist who studies protest movements, civil resistance, and authoritarianism. She's currently directing the Horizons Project, an NPO that intends to bring about social change in the United States. Dr. Stefan was director at the U.S. Institute of Peace. She has worked for the State Department in Afghanistan, Syria, and Turkey, and at the NATO headquarters in Brussels. Is the author of Civilian Jihad, Nonviolent Struggle, Democratization, and Governance in the Middle East, 2009, and co-authored with Erika Chenoweth, Chenoweth in 20, 2010, Why Civil Resistant Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict, a book that received several awards and has become a groundbreaking text for social organizers. Many more books and publications, essays, but I leave it at that. Her work has been discussed on numerous national media outlets. I'm grateful that Dr. Stefan can be here with us tonight. I'm as grateful that Professor Emeritus Charles Cohen, former E. Gordon Fox Professor of American Institutions, historian of religion and colonial America, former director of the Luba Institute for the Abrahamic Religions, agreed to moderate the discussion following the talk. The discussion we thought we can use, re reuse these um, little uh, hats, and we kindly ask you to write your questions, and then we collect the questions um, here up front and um, have a somewhat guided uh, Q&A after the talk. Um, I want to remind people in the audience to be mindful of the way they phrase their questions, because sometimes our speech can be harmful to others. And now, with that, please welcome Dr. Maria Stefan. Thank you, Ulrich, for that uh, very kind introduction. And good evening, everyone. 
Um, <clears throat> I'd first like to thank uh, the UW-Madison Student Affairs and Dean Christina Olstad, uh, the Center for Interfaith Dialogue, and the Interfaith Peace Working Group for inviting me to speak with you all tonight. And special thanks to Ulrich, to Jerry, and to Mo uh, for all your work in organizing tonight's event, um, and also for your great work on the Nonviolence Project, which is also inspiring tonight's event. I am so grateful to be here with you all this evening. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be able to lift up the power and promise of nonviolent action at a time when violence and war here at home, in Israel, Palestine, in Ukraine and elsewhere around the world is surely on all of our minds and on our hearts. But I should say first that this is my first trip to Madison and to the great state of Wisconsin. Um, I had a great opportunity to receive a tour of downtown Madison um, offered by Paula and Tom and Anne this afternoon. So we strolled up uh, State Street and the Capitol building, and then of course ended up at Fromagination to check out the cheese situation. So I received a very nice tour of your beautiful city. And I should say the cheese point is very relevant because I was born and raised in Vermont, where as you might know, uh, we also take our cheese and our dairy very seriously. And some might even say that there is competition between our two states in the area of cheese. Now, I was aware that Wisconsin made excellent cheddar, but it was only in Kabul, Afghanistan, that I became aware of just how much cheese pride resides in the state. It was 2009, and I was serving in the U.S. State Department at our embassy in Kabul. And we were living in shipping containers, also known as hooches, on the embassy compound. And my neighbor was a guy named Mark, who was from Wisconsin, and he worked for the US Agency for International Development. And now when I saw Mark walk out of his hooch one day wearing a cheese hat, I was quite surprised. We would not do that in Vermont. However, I was so impressed that Mark was, uh, he cared enough about it to transport his dairy apparel to Kabul, Afghanistan. So I then understand, and we had a, a lot of fun with our nonviolent cheese wars that year. Um, and it was also in Kabul, uh, in the middle of a war zone, uh, with duck and cover sirens going off, with Taliban mortar rounds um, going off near the embassy, that I was also working on a book manuscript that became Why Civil Resistance Works, whose insights will inform my remarks tonight. But first, maybe a bit about um, how I got involved in this work, um, since people of faith um, played a very important role. So growing up in rural Vermont, one of my first encounters with organizing and activism was living and working at the Rutland Dismas House, a transitional home for former prisoners and college students that my parents, Marianne and Phil, both people of deep faith, are very involved in. Dismas House was founded by Father Jack Hickey, a Dominican priest in Nashville, Tennessee in the 1970s. Its mission is to reconcile former prisoners with society and society with former prisoners. Now, when a Dismas House was first proposed in Rutland, there was a fierce not in my backyard sentiment, good old NIMBY. It took, so there was all this backlash happening and it took the persistence and dedication of faith leaders and people of faith in the community who emphasized the moral, spiritual, and practical value of second chances and reconciliation, including the savings to taxpayers of investing in alternatives to prisons, uh, to turn the tide. So churches and other faith institutions became a critical part of the volunteer infrastructure that keeps Dismas House running today as one of the most effective organizations in the state. So that was my first exposure to faith-based uh, nonviolent action. Now, I also have a group of Benedictine monks from the Weston Priory in Weston, Vermont, to thank for my applied faith formation. The monks were great role models, living simply off the land, celebrating mass in a barn, and taking in refugees who had fled the wars in Central America in the 1980s. They also ran a wonderful bookstore 
filled with books on peace and nonviolence that included the biographies of Dorothy Day, Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, Oscar Romero, Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Thich Nhat Hanh, Ella Baker, the Berrigan brothers, Reverend John Deere, and so many others. And had, the, had that bookstore been in this state, I probably would have come across writings about great Wisconsin civil rights leaders like Vell Phillips, Lloyd Barbie, and Father James Groppy, who organized campaigns against segregation and for racial justice in Milwaukee and across the state in the 1960s. I was deeply moved by the stories of these great nonviolent leaders and the struggles they led against war, authoritarianism, and other forms of tyranny. So after studying political science at Boston College, where I was slightly indoctrinated by the Jesuits, but in a good way, um, and after living overseas in France and in Germany, um, where I studied European integration and the European peace process, I decided to focus on international peace and security issues. So initially that took me to the Pentagon, to the, in the office of the Secretary of Defense, and to NATO headquarters in Brussels, where I grew familiar with the workings of the military and the national security community. And while I'm grateful for those experiences, life had something different in store for me. During my graduate studies at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts, I attended the Boston launch of a new documentary film called A Force More Powerful. A Force More Powerful, which was nominated for an Emmy Award, told the stories of six nonviolent struggles that changed the course of history including the Gandhi-led independence movement in India, the Danish resistance to the Nazi occupation, the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, the Nashville lunch counter sit-ins during the US civil rights movement, the Polish solidarity movement, and the Chilean democracy movement that ousted uh, dictator Augusto Pinochet. This film, by the way, is free, available free of charge um, online on the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict website. So in each of these six cases, unarmed civilians had confronted violent regimes and tyrants with tactics of nonviolent resistance, including strikes, boycotts, sit-ins, marches, civil disobedience, and other acts of nonviolent defiance. And they prevailed against huge odds. There was a profound faith dimension to most of these struggles. In Poland, Catholic churches allied with workers and students to lead the solidarity movement against communist dictatorship. Desmond Tutu in the South African Anglican Church provided spiritual and organizing power to that country's movement against apartheid and transition to multiracial democracy. It is impossible to understand the U.S. civil rights movement in this country and its role in dismantling Jim Crow racial apartheid without understanding the role of black churches, which provided moral power, spiritual nourishment, and organizational infrastructure for that multiracial movement. Taking other powerful nonviolent struggles, some will recall images of Catholic nuns kneeling before tanks and heavily armed soldiers in the Philippines during Ferdinand Marcos' reign of terror in the 1980s, before a mass people power movement removed him nonviolently from power. A faith-based organization, the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, led trainings in nonviolent action in churches across the Philippines to prepare the population to resist. In Myanmar, Buddhist monks have been in the vanguard of nonviolent resistance against the country's military junta while imams and devout Muslims have been in the front lines of struggles against dictatorship in Tunisia, Egypt, Iran, and elsewhere in the Middle East. The Huda Hidmagar movement, a Muslim Pashtun movement that led resistance against the British Raj in colonial India, formed the first nonviolent army in the history of the world with red uniforms and strict codes of conduct. These stories all piqued my interest. How was it possible for genocidal dictators, military occupations, and violent apartheid regimes to be defeated without relying on violence? I wanted to better understand the strategies and tactics that ordinary people could use to challenge repression and win. So after wrapping up my PhD dissertation, 
which focused on the role of nonviolent resistance in the Palestinian, East Timorese, and Kosovo Albanian self determination struggles, I moved to DC to work with the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, or ICNC. ICNC is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the study and practice of strategic nonviolent action. There, I was working with courageous activists and dissidents from all over the world. And I also learned from US civil rights leaders, including Reverend James Lawson, who led many of the nonviolent trainings during the civil rights movement, and Mary King, who was active in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. From these activists and leaders, I grew to appreciate just how important strategy, planning, and training was to the success of nonviolent struggles. While working at ICNC, I met Erica Chenoweth, a fellow political scientist who is now a Harvard professor. At the time that Erica and I met, there was a tremendous amount of skepticism about the efficacy of nonviolent resistance and its ability to succeed, particularly in the most repressive environments. So it's good to be skeptical. And in fact, there had never been a study to systematically compare the efficacy of violent and nonviolent resistance. So we decided to do that ourselves. We spent the next two plus years collecting data on over 330 major violent and nonviolent campaigns over the, over the course of the past century. These were major political campaigns challenging incumbent regimes and those seeking territorial independence, where success was defined as removing the incumbent regime or achieving territorial self-determination within one year of the peak protests. The findings uh, that we had at that time were very surprising and counterintuitive for many people. So we found that the nonviolent campaigns succeeded twice as often as the armed insurgencies. They succeeded about 52% of the time compared to 26% of the time for the violent campaigns. We also discovered that nonviolent resistance was a major driver of democratic transitions. Um, and multiple other studies have found that nonviolent campaigns are the strongest bulwark against authoritarianism around the world. So not only do nonviolent campaigns tend to lead to more democratic societies, which makes sense given the skills involved in building broad-based coalitions and bringing people together across differences, they also tend to produce more peaceful societies. Armed insurgencies, on the other hand, may succeed. They did in about 25% of the cases that we looked at. However, they are almost always accompanied by mass killings and other atrocities and almost never lead to democratic societies. So what gave civil resistance the strategic advantage or why does civil resistance work? We found that the most important explanation is that nonviolent campaigns on average attract a significantly larger and more diverse participation base compared to armed struggles. Whereas armed resistance tends to rely on young, able-bodied men, in nonviolent resistance, anyone can participate. Young, old, men, women, rich, poor, disabled, able-bodied, anyone can participate in nonviolent resistance. And mass diverse participation enhances a movement's strength, legitimacy, and power. When Erica later ran more numbers after the book came out, they found that no regime has remained in power when 3.5% of the population has been engaged in active protest, the so-called 3.5% rule. So why is mass diverse participation so important? Well, here it's important to start with the simple but revolutionary idea underpinning the whole field of civil resistance articulated by Gene Sharp and others, which holds that no power holder, no matter how powerful, can stay in power without the support of ordinary people. People provide the skills, knowledge, labor, legitimacy, money, and other resources that power holders need to maintain control. And when large numbers of people from key organizations and institutions in society, such as educational institutions, 
bureaucracies, unions, professional associations, religious institutions, businesses, security forces, police. When those institutions withdraw their consent and cooperation from the regime, it loses its power, sometimes completely. And I showed this with a diagram here, just so you have a sense, since the pillars of support concept is so important in the field of nonviolent action. And I recognize not everyone's gonna be able to see it, but you see here this like power pyramid. And at the top is the regime. And the regime wants you, whether it's a corporation, an authoritarian regime, corrupt local government, it could be any sort of power holding. The regime wants you to believe that power flows from the top down. But what we know is that the regime is held up by these institutional pillars. And I mentioned a few, but there are media outlets, there are businesses, unions, educational institutions, police, uh, armies, parliaments. And the, the reality is that these institutional pillars provide all the support that the regime needs to stay in power. And when the regime can no longer count on the support of these pillars, it loses its power. And that's the key kind of idea of why civil resistance works. So to give you some historical examples of what that meant in practice, Augusto Pinochet in Chile was forced to leave power following a mass general strike led by students, copper miners, and other groups. And when the military refused to back Pinochet's attempt to overturn the results of the referendum that he lost in 1988. So he lost the military support. The military refused to obey. When the South African apartheid regime could no longer count on the support of white business owners who were being targeted with organized consumer boycotts, it was forced then to negotiate with Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress, which paved the way to South Africa's democratic transition. So prompting defections and loyalty shifts in a regime's key pillars of support and dividing the regime from its key pillars of support is key to the success of nonviolent struggles. So mass diverse participation and defections and loyalty shifts within key pillars of support. So the fact that large and diverse participation is so critical to the success of, of movements ex, um, explains why expanding the base of a movement beyond the usual suspects is so important. You can't get to 3.5% of the population if you are only mobilizing allies and people who agree with you. You also need to be able to reach those who may hold different views or ideologies, or those with whom you disagree on many things, but can agree on a few things. The importance of building broad-based alliances and coalitions to achieve major goals also highlights why especially on college campuses, the ability to dialogue across differences, to gather information by learning from different perspectives and viewpoints, and to seek common ground so that it becomes possible to engage in collective action is so critical. Now, this does not mean abandoning deeply held beliefs, values, or principles. But it does mean rejecting narrow ideological litmus tests that prevent us from welcoming new people into our movements who are maybe not completely aligned with us on every issue. And it also means avoiding demonizing those who may be our potential allies. So this topic seems particularly relevant considering the tragedy that continues to unfold in Israel and Palestine. And I know that people on this campus and in most of the spaces that I've been part of recently, especially those with family in the region, are experiencing profound pain, trauma, and hurt. I've been reflecting on the saying that hurt people hurt people. And there is a time and a place for dialogue, and there is a time and a place for nonviolent direct action. And sometimes you need both at the same time, and this may be one of those times. But what I would say is that I would encourage folks to pay attention to the prophets in our midst, to those who have found the ability to hold all of hum humanity in their hearts, who can apply principles of freedom, security, and justice universally, for they hold the key to transforming a conflict that has caused too much pain for too many people for too long. 
I actually spent time in Israel and the West Bank doing field research for my dissertation. And one of the cases was later included as a chapter in why civil resistance works. And the case was focused on the role of nonviolent resistance during the first Palestinian Intifada, a mass popular uprising in the late 80s and early 90s against the Israeli occupation, led by Palestinians living in the occupied West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem. I interviewed Palestinians and Israelis who had been active during the Intifada, an uprising that featured a wide array of nonviolent tactics, including strikes, boycotts, walkouts, marches, underground schools, victory gardens, and involved the active participation of nearly every segment of Palestinian society, notably women, along with solidarity actions by Israeli Jews. It was a remarkable period of Palestinian self-determination struggle and one that was captured in a documentary film by the organization Just Vision called Nyla and the Uprising, which I commend to folks. So as we consider what comes next in the region, which may be very difficult, if not impossible to do in this moment when there's so much pain, I would just encourage folks to think about ways to support those who are committed to nonviolent resistance to violence, authoritarianism, and occupation on all sides of the conflict. And this may be the only pathway to freedom, peace, and security for two peoples who desperately deserve it. It's also important in times like this, I think, to be able to identify sources of hope and inspiration. For me, a profound source of hope lies in young people, in the movements that they are leading. I've had the great fortune of being able to work with youth activists involved in various struggles for rights, freedom, democracy, and peace around the world. This has included members of the Serbian Opfor movement, a student-led movement that ousted Slobodan Milosevic, known as the Butcher of the Balkans, from power in the year 2000. Otpor youth were absolutely brilliant at using humor, rock concerts, and other creative, life-affirming tactics to mobilize the Serbian population in a context of heightened fear and repression following more than a decade of brutal ethnic conflict and war in the Balkans. If folks haven't seen the Peabody award-winning documentary film Bringing Down a Dictator about the Serbian Otpor movement, I highly recommend it. I also learned a lot about organizing from these Serbian youth. The first groups that Otpor actively recruited in their pro-democracy movement were high school students and retired people. The former because of their energy, risk-taking ability, and perceived innocence, and the latter because they, had, they were respected members of society who had more time to volunteer, to make calls, to hand out pamphlets. So that's who they pr prioritize in their organizing strategy. And this makes me think of the theme song to the awesome film Selma about the 1965 Selma to Montgomery voting rights marches. And the theme song was sung by John Legend. And the line goes, it takes the wisdom of the elders and the young people's energy. Welcome to the story we call victory. So I think that's the intergenerational part of movements is so critically important. And I thought about this song when meeting with youth activists from Hong Kong, who inspired by elder Bruce Lee's adage to be like water, used dispersed nonviolent tactics like flash mobs to challenge the Chinese backed authoritarian government. I can also almost guarantee that any meaningful pressure applied on governments and corporations in the US and around the world to stop fossil fuel production and address the climate crisis will be the result of youth-led agitation and activism. Greta Thunberg inspired student walkouts, while groups like Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil are using more disruptive forms of nonviolent action. The Sunrise Movement in the US has combined dialogue and direct action uh, to generate urgency and action around, cl around climate change. I would also flag the movement to stop the Keystone XL pipeline in 2021, 
which included environmental organizations, grassroots climate activists, farmers, landowners, indigenous rights groups, and tribal governments, um, which was a very important victory for the climate movement. And some of you in this room may have heard of the organization called the Third Act, which was co-founded by Bill McKibbins, which is specifically focused on organizing boomers and the older generation to put their weight and resources behind youth-led climate justice movements, which I think is really excellent. So this leads to another important finding from the research. Having more people from different positions and parts of society actively involved in nonviolent campaigns tends to increase tactical innovation. And expanding the repertoire of nonviolent tactics is critical to the success of movements. So mass diverse participation, prompting loyalty shifts and defections from key pillars of support, and now tactical innovation. So in particular, the ability of movements to shake things up and alternate between methods of concentration, like street rallies, protests, and demonstrations, and methods of dispersion, like stayaways, walkouts, go slows, boycotts, makes it more, much more difficult to repress while increasing the social, political, and economic leverage of the movement. I would note that Michael Beer from Nonviolence International recently published a report on the hundreds, if not thousands, of nonviolent tactics available to activists and ordinary people alike. And this helps explain the power and potential of nonviolent action. Only the imagination is the limit when it comes to ways to practice nonviolent action. One of my favorite tactics uh, during the Syrian uprising against the Assad dictatorship in 2011 was when Syrian activists painted ping pong balls red and dumped them down hills and popular walking areas in Damascus and other cities. The balls, whose color signified the bloodshed of the Assad regime, had defiant messages like freedom or Quria in Arabic painted on them. And then there was a Sahrawi activist from the occupied Western Sahara who attached paper signs denouncing the Moroccan occupation to stray cats and dogs who then wandered about the cities and towns, which was an incredibly creative means of communication and also a way to demonstrate dissent in an incredibly highly repressive context. So lots of creativity and ingenuity in various nonviolent actions. And although we sometimes get very fixated on street protests and demonstrations and marches, acts of organized non-cooperation tend to pack the biggest punch when it comes to nonviolent struggle. So take the Gdansk shipyard strike during the Polish Solidarity Movement that forced negotiations about independent labor unions that ultimately paved the way to the end of communist dictatorship. Or the Montgomery bus boycott in the Nashville lunch counter sit-ins during the US civil rights movement that forced white business owners to end segregation policies. Meanwhile, think about the recent strikes by the United Auto Workers and by the screenwriters and actors guilds, which have led to significant victories for workers demanding fairness in the US. So another key variable, we have mass diverse participation, loyalty shifts and key pillars of support, tactical innovation. Another key variable in the success of nonviolent campaigns is being able to anticipate violent repression by governments and non-governmental actors to prepare for it and to main non, maintain nonviolent discipline as a sign of strength, not of weakness. Discipline is key to winning the moral and strategic high ground while making the regime's use of violence backfire. We know how much effort governments invest in getting, trying to get opposition groups to use violence or to become violent. In order, they use things like agent provocateurs. They, they you know, plant people in protest. This is part of a government strategy often because they know that the violence will divide the movement, diminish participation, and make their crackdown seem justified in the name of law and order. So this really highlights the importance of training and preparation. So in a second book that Erica Chenoweth and I wrote together on the role of external support to movements, we found that support for training and peer learning was the most consistently helpful form of external support to movements. 
workshops that feature scenario planning, role plays, uh, strategic and tactical planning, de-escalation techniques, uh, tactical innovation. This is all critically important. Critical too is investment in community care, mutual aid networks, and solidarity infrastructure to support resilience in the face of violence and repression. In, in research conducted by Erica Chenoweth and Zoe Marks, they found that women's active participation in nonviolent struggles is strongly correlated with the success of those campaigns because women's participation tends to increase the level of nonviolent discipline, which in turn increases the level of participation, which in turn increases the likelihood of success. So to this, to you all, student community leaders, I can't emphasize enough how important investment in training power analysis, scenario planning, and strategic and tactical planning are to the success of campaigns and movements. I worry sometimes that social media enabled fast mobilization and the desire for quick results have discouraged the kind of deep investment in training, planning, and relational organizing that movements thrive on. Now that still might include trainings in church basements, but it also includes developing YouTube and TikTok videos about strategic nonviolent action. And maybe some folks in this room are involved in that kind of work. So there are some great um, power and strategy training tools. Um, I would commend to folks the Democracy Hub, which is found on the Common Social Change Library, on the Beautiful Trouble website, on the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict website, and I would also commend a brand new book written by Deepak Bhargava and Stephanie Luce called Practical Radicals, which includes lots of different uh, training materials that you might find, might find helpful for your organizing. Now, I, I would ask my colleagues to put up uh, the slide. One important thing to know about nonviolent resistance in the world today is there has been a veritable explosion of people power in nonviolent protests globally. There have been more campaigns of civil resistance in the past decade than in any other time in human history. However, so this just notes the explosion of nonviolent, nonviolent resistance for a long time has been the most a common form of resistance around the world. So this shows the prevalence. Now, if you turn to the next slide, please. However, there is some very not good news. Um, Erica Chenoweth, who developed these slides, found that the overall success rate of major nonviolent campaigns has dropped precipitously in that same uh, decade. So there has been a significant decline in the, in the effectiveness of nonviolent campaigns. Now, there are a few possible explanations for the drop in movement effectiveness, including significant authoritarian learning and adaptation. Authoritarian regimes around the world have adopted smart repression tactics, no longer relying on brute force and instead investing massively in surveillance, in the quelling of independent media, and in the quiet subversion of democratic norms and institutions, as we've seen in places like Hungary, Brazil, Turkey, India, Hong Kong, and increasingly in the United States. At the same time, movements themselves are showing signs of weakness. In our fast social media age, it's very easy to start campaigns and to get people out into the streets. It's much harder to sustain participation and to remain resilient in the face of repression, particularly when your opponents are well-funded and highly committed. So one of the reasons why the declining success rate of nonviolent campaigns is so troubling is that authoritarianism is on the rise around the world and in the United States. And I think these two phenomena are closely related. The global democracy watchdog organization Freedom House, in its most recent Freedom in the World report, reports 17 consecutive years of declining declines in democratic freedoms and a rise in authoritarianism around the world. Today, 38% of the global population lives in not free countries. Only 20% of the global population lives in free countries. The United States was classified as a backsliding democracy in 2021 for the first time following deadly police violence and the January 6th insurrectionary attack 
an attempt to overturn the 2020 election. So these are all troubling trends, albeit not irreversible. And I will return to the democratic crisis in the US in the moment. But I wanted to first reflect for a couple of minutes on the situation in Russia and Ukraine, where authoritarianism and war interact very closely. Some of you may know that twice in recent history, mass popular uprisings in Ukraine, the Orange Revolution in 2005 and the Maidan movement in 2014, helped remove Russian-backed dictators from power. However, Ukrainians had difficulties in sustaining the democratic transitions. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin has consolidated authoritarian control in Russia while acting on its territorial ambitions in Ukraine. When Russia attacked Ukraine last year, it was remarkable to witness the civil resistance by Ukrainians inside Ukraine and by Russians who opposed the war inside Russia. That included Ukrainians thwarting Russian military advances with demonstrations, roadblocks, and blockades. They refused to cooperate with Russian occupation forces by refusing aid from the occupiers, from refusing to speak in Russian, and in setting up alternative administrative structures. They sang pro-Ukrainian songs and slogans. They held interfaith religious ceremonies in, Ukraine, in the Ukrainian language and they set up mutual aid networks. Meanwhile, inside Russia, where it is very high risk to protest Putin's war, there have been individual and collective acts of defiance. During a live news broadcast, a prominent Russian TV journalist walked in front of the camera holding a sign condemning the war. Close to 300 Russian Orthodox priests and deacons from around the world signed an open letter of opposition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Meanwhile, hundreds of Russian conscientious objectors have refused to fight in Ukraine and are, on, or, and are supporting other military defectors. Although most of the media and policy attention are focused on the military aspects of the war, it is important to continue to highlight that civil resistance against the Russian invasion and occupation continues inside Ukraine, in Russia, and in the region. Groups like Nonviolence International, Patrir, the Romanian Peace Institute, and a transatlantic platform called All for Peace are focused on it. Calling attention to the nonviolent resistance and getting resources to support it is an important way to bring an end to the devastating war in Ukraine. Now, I've spoken about the rise of authoritarianism globally and about how authoritarian leaders and their enablers use divide and rule tactics to consolidate power while gutting democratic norms and institutions. Other parts of the authoritarian playbook, and there is a playbook that has been translated into many languages around the world, um, other parts of the playbook include spreading lies and conspiracies, undermining basic civil liberties, targeting opponents in historically marginalized groups with violence and repression, and normalizing political violence, including in the US police violence. These are all tactics and part of the authoritarian playbook. So I wanna conclude with some reflections on the United States. The US, a country whose founding principles of freedom and justice for all have inspired countless peoples in this country and around the world, myself included, also has a history of authoritarianism. This history has been rooted in systemic racism. It includes 250 years of chattel slavery and another century of treating African Americans politically, legally, and culturally as inferior human beings or as subhumans. Dr. King wrote in 1967, ever since the birth of our nation, White America has had a schizophrenic personality on the question of race. She has been torn between selves, a self in which she proudly professed the great principles of democracy and a self in which she, sh she sadly practiced the antithesis of democracy. Reflecting on my own ed education growing up in the very white state of Vermont, I wish that I had learned more about the post-Civil War reconstruction and redemption periods, including the ways in which propaganda and conspiracy theories reinforce the notion of the lost cause 
and of white racial superiority, and how Jim Crow emerged after the fall of Reconstruction as a single party authoritarian system that was at that time anchored in the Democratic Party. As Isabel Wilkerson wrote in her excellent book, Cast, German Nazis studied Jim Crow's racial caste system assiduously, even deeming parts of that system too extreme to be applied in Germany. It took the civil rights movement, the greatest pro-democracy movement in our country's history, to dismantle Jim Crow and to achieve multiracial democracy via the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. But with every advance has come backlash. In the 1960s and 70s, the backlash included the expansion of the state repressive apparatus via policing and mass incarceration, followed by a war on drugs that disproportionately targeted black and brown communities. Now, while there has been a great deal of focus on how former President Donald Trump and the MAGA movement have accelerated anti-democratic trends, and it's true that an authoritarian faction that was once anchored in the Democratic Party is now firmly entrenched in the GOP, Trumpism is a reflection of U.S. society. There continues to be a struggle over who counts as a U.S. citizen and who is allowed to participate meaningfully and fully in our politics and society. This struggle includes those who are committed to preserving a white, Christian, male-dominated country, and those who are committed to an inclusive, pluralistic, multiracial society where everyone can flourish, which I believe is one of the most important struggles of our time. At a time when we are seeing upticks in nearly every indicator of political violence in this country, including death threats targeting election officials and school board members, when states are banning books deemed offensive, reminiscent of Nazi Germany, when educators are being attacked for teaching a full history of the United States, warts and all, and when anti-protester bills are chilling free speech, when anti-LGBTQ uh, bills are spreading across the country, and when a significant part of the U.S. population continues to believe that the 2020 election was stolen, this all suggests that we have our work cut out for us. With all that is happening, we need to build the largest coalition possible to stop the authoritarian trends while tapping into the powerful ideals aspirations and movements that make America great. At the same time, we need to see advancing racial justice and strengthening democracy as two sides of the same coin. The Horizons Project that I co-lead is committed to supporting others in building a large and powerful pro-democracy movement that brings Americans together across difference to doggedly reject political violence and authoritarianism using dialogue and nonviolent resistance while building an inclusive multiracial democracy where everyone can thrive with dignity and respect. We know this movement must include progressives and conservatives, whites and Americans of color, workers and professionals, those from cities and those from rural areas, youth and older folks. We work closely with peace builders and bridge builders, with those fighting for racial and economic justice, and those working to build trust in our elections and who are advancing structural reforms to our democracy. We support the work of the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Movement, which is working at the local, state, and national level to acknowledge and address the harms of systemic racism as a means of promoting healing and transformation in our society. So in conclusion, and I was reflecting um, with my friends, my host earlier today, that sometimes when it can seem very bleak and depressing. What gives the most hope is being in company with other organizers and people who are engaged in the action. The organizing is what gives hope. So in conclusion, the message that I hope to leave you with tonight is that despite the darkness and the injustice in our world and in our country, there is a force more powerful than violence, one that can create and transform rather than dehumanize and destroy. That is the promise and the potential of nonviolence and nonviolent action. All of us, students, faculty, 
community and faith leaders and people of faith and conviction have both a responsibility and also an awesome opportunity to nurture and strengthen it. And I'm so grateful for UW-Madison and the Interfaith Peace Working Group for your commitment to doing exactly that. Thank you all. So I'm now going to turn it over to Chuck, who's going to moderate the discussion. And to start, um, the uh, sticky notes that you have are multi-purpose sticky notes. You've already used them once. Now please use them to uh, scribble a question on them, pass them to the center aisle. They'll be collected. Uh, I suspect there will be far more questions uh, than will uh, Professor Stefan or Dr. Stefan will have time to answer, uh, but we'll try. Um, so, if, yeah, if you just pass them to the center aisle and they'll be collected, and then I will call them. Okay, well, this is at least one I can, this is one I can read, <laughs> though I am in no position to cast stones. Um, how can nonviolent action be used to interrupt violence? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. Because um, we were discussing earlier today that a lot of the focus of nonviolent action is how to prevent uh, violence. But what I would, how I would start to answer that question is that, sadly, political violence targeting nonviolent movements is the norm, actually. So we found that over 90% of the campaigns in our data set involved uh, campaigns that were facing some form of political violence. And whether it was regime violence, whether it was paramilitary or militia violence, so sadly, violence is the norm. And then it matters how a movement responds in context of violence. Um, so that is why, for example, the ability to maintain discipline is so critically important because that is what allows uh, a, move, a regime or paramilitary's use of violence to backfire. So the other thing to consider related to this, these pillars of support is in the context of violence, whether it's civil war, whether it's insurgency, what are the pillars of support to the violent actors? Who is providing them with media outlets, with financial resources, with moral support, spiritual support? And how can you think about nonviolent campaigns that target those pillars of support? So, and I'm thinking of all the examples of the major um, campaigns, whether it was anti-apartheid, whether it was uh, Poland, the Polish Solidarity Movement, was occurring with 20,000 uh, communist troops on Polish soil during the entirety of the campaign. I'm thinking about Chile, where there was a reign of terror, the Philippines. So in all those cases, the key was for the nonviolent movement to be able to mobilize large numbers of people. And the closer you get to the elements of repression, so when you have people in your movement that are closer to the security forces, who are closer to the police, who are closer to the people in a regime who are giving orders to use violence, that gives power to your movement. And that's another reason why expanding um, the diversity of movements is so important. This is also the reason why often some movements, the reason why women's participation has been so critical is that in many cases where there are violence in civil war, I'm thinking Sudan, for example, and the role of women in the most recent popular uprising against the Bashir regime. Incredible, genocidal violence. This is a regime that's known for engaging in genocide. 
And this was a movement led in large part by women, along with different community organizations, youth groups, that, that organized, that expanded, that used different tactics um, that didn't make people so vulnerable. So that's the other key thing. How do you think about choosing tactics that don't just rely on confrontations with security forces? So how do you use tactics like going slow, walking slowly in the streets, which Burmese have used in incredibly repressive environments. They show dissent by just going slowly and talking to each other while they're walking slowly. Or I'm thinking about Chile, where the copper miners who went, were planning a major strike during the reign of Pinochet, when they learned that the mines were going to be uh, invaded by security forces, they changed their tactics. So they did a sit-in instead of a strike. So you need like different types of tactics, tactical innovation, uh, and you need to plan for violence. And that's why I was mentioning the, the training so much, because when you think to our civil rights movement, civil rights leaders knew that they were going to be attacked by KKK members. They planned for it. They plan for what to do, what not to do, when to engage, when to de-escalate. So I think, like with starting with the premise that your movement is going to face some type of violence and then organizing, preparing for it. Um, those are all, I think, critically parts uh, of the answer to that question. And another thing I would flag in places like Colombia, for example, in the context of civil war, my colleague Oliver Kaplan has written a, a book about how communities create peace zones in the middle of civil wars. So how you carve out space where there are no weapon zones, where people are socially ostracized if they, if they violate principles. There were, so there are different things that communities can do themselves, even in the context of civil war, to neutralize the violence. Well, we've got a week's worth of questions. Um, what does nonviolent action look like when it comes to speech? I mean, um, the freedom of speech is an internationally recognized human right. Um, I think so one, one thing that, um, one way to think about that, that question is oftentimes nonviolent actions themselves are forms of political speech. So when people are out in the streets or they're protesting, they're holding signs, they're holding vigils, they're doing die-ins, that is a form of political communication and political speech. So that's one way to think about that question. But I would also offer that eliminating free speech is often the tried and true tactic of authoritarians around the world who don't want free speech. So often, even raising your voice in protest in some countries, as we all know, can get you in prison, killed, um, other. Taking off a headscarf in Iran can result in terrible consequences. Um, and so actions, so regimes don't like um, free speech. And that's why demanding free speech is often, um, you know, a critical demand of a lot of nonviolent movements. But I think besides the traditional understanding of speech and writing, um, humor is one of the most powerful forms of free speech and political communication, which, you know, has been used to challenge tyranny and authoritarianism. So, uh, free speech, critical to the success of movements and often um, the first thing that gets attacked and undermined. You spoke uh, earlier about uh, events in Israel-Palestine. This question asks, can you explain why the nonviolent resistance in the late 1980s, early 1990s failed in the West Bank? Yeah. So that's a great, that's a great, um, that's a great question. So what I would say is, um, I don't think that the first intifada failed, actually. Um, in our data set, the first intifada is coded as a partial success because without this uprising, there would have been um, no negotiations about Palestinian statehood. So it led to the Madrid talks and the Oslo talks. I think what failed then was uh, a negotiation process that did not include the leaders of the first intifada. So what happened was you had, you know, you had kind of a game-changing period 
of protest demonstration strikes and the like, which did, which involved Palestinians across the board in the occupied territories, which shifted the calculus of Israel. And I, I interviewed IDF generals who were the first ones to say to me, quote in the dissertation, we don't do Gandhi well. So it was like, it profoundly changed the relationship between uh, the Palestinian people and Israel. For the first time during the first intifada and the crackdown that followed, for the first time the US was willing to uh, vote against Israel because of its crackdown at the UN. So even the US was willing to apply pressure on Israel. So it achieved a lot in 18 months. But then a negotiation process came along, and I'm not against the negotiation or the peace process, but there were some fundamental flaws. And what happened was a Palestinian authority that had been outside the territories, who weren't leading the protest demonstrations uprising, became the main negotiation partner. And what happened was an agreement that then kind of repackaged the, the occupation in a different way. And so it led to some improvements, but then what happened was settlements expanded. And, you know, so, and there was attacks happening in the, in the occupied territories. And so the aspects of the, of the occupation intensified. And that was the problem. And then, you know, there hasn't been a tremendous focus on a real peace process. And as we all know in this, in this room, there are many people committed to seeing peace fail between the two peoples. And those actors have been empowered. So I think even though the first intifada did not lead to, mean, to meaningful self-determination or statehood for Palestinians, um, which is why it's not coded as a success, I would nevertheless conclude still that the first 18 months of that intifada achieved more than any resistance before or after that time. And I, I mean, there's a lot to be said. That was not the only episode of Palestinian-led nonviolent resistance, as we know. But what was happening during that time, the level of participation, the level of involvement, the level of solidarity. That's why I wanted to interview Israeli Jews who were actively involved in the protest during the first intifada. That fascinated me. And I think even though the context has changed, um, I still believe that this strategy is the only hope for that conflict and for Palestinians to achieve self-determination. <clears throat> this one is going to strike a little bit at home for you. The book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline, critiques your book and advocates climate change activism of property destruction that does not kill or injure anyone. How do you respond? Yeah, and by the way, I saw the film, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. I thought it was super engaging and interesting. I understand it's um, very popular. Um, so what I would say to that, I was, I was intrigued because I heard about that. I have not spoken to the authors, but we, in the book, we don't define property damage as violence. Um, so we have a very strict definition of violence in the book because we needed to kind of compare apples to apples. So violence, um, the way we define it in the book is that which inflicts or threatens to inflict bodily harm on another human being. So, but we do point out that property damage can be a slippery slope. So property damage can then often lead to other forms of escalatory violence. But I was, I was surprised when, um, when they were attacking that point because that was not actually how we, we defined um, violence in the book. And our whole book is about the use of militant forms of nonviolent action um, to achieve goals. So, you know, this is a long debate though, as you all um, are probably aware about property destruction and when it can be helpful, when it can be harmful. Those of you who are in the anti-war movement know that, you know, damaging nuclear parts of nuclear uh, uh, submarines and nuclear apparatus while posting this is why we did it this is the purpose and going to be arrested so we are voluntarily um, seeking arrest because we engage in this act of civil disobedience 
So these have been part of the canon of nonviolent protests and nonviolent resistance. And so, and you know, we all know as part of the resistance to the Nazis um, that you know railroad tracks were were exploded. Although, you know, then when it becomes tricky is like if the intention is to blow up a train on the railroad tracks, then that's, you know, maybe that goes over the line to something else, some other form of resistance. So I think, you know, um, I understand the sentiments of people who are talking about property damage and more militant forms of nonviolent action when it comes to the environment and to climate, because it's a crisis. It's like incredibly urgent and there hasn't been enough that's been done. So I understand the sentiment. But I would say there's often caution when it comes to property damage because you may lose support based on how people perceive the action. They may not perceive it in the way that you do. And so the question becomes, how are you trying to mobilize more people to come to the movement? And will that set of tactics achieve that or not? And that is a question for organizers and activists. So I'm afraid that we're running out of. Uh, time. There are a couple more things to wrap the event up. So I've got one more question for you now. And I suspect it's one that uh, virtually everyone in this room is thinking in one form or another. And you raised it yourself late in the talk. What do you do to sustain yourself emotionally, spiritually, and physically for this work? Yeah, no, that's a great question, because um, you have to find a way to care for yourselves and for your communities um, to be able to stay in the fight for a long time. And different people have different ways to do that. Some people turn to yoga or, you know, therapy and the like. I tend to want to commune with nature. Um, that's maybe part of the Vermonter in me. We're just getting out away from things, running, walking, being away in nature can help with my personal reset. Um, I tend to read more works of fiction than I do works of nonfiction. So reading novels um, is a powerful form of self-care for me. Um, and being in community and with friends. Um, now that I live in New York, I more frequently go to comedy shows because comedy clubs are very common in New York. And so just like that can be um, also just a place to laugh and connect with people and with community. But I think that point of being with other people who are struggling, but who are working, who are organizing, who are in it can be the most important thing that you do. If you're doom scrolling or constantly just in your head about all the terrible things are happening and you're not in company with other people, that can be really, really hard. So I think being with good people um, and celebrating life and celebrating joys um, is really, really important. Thank you very much. And I'd like to give the microphone to Paul Aragi, who will lead us in a reflection next. Okay, everybody remember their partners? Okay, so this is the question we want you to answer. Have your ideas about nonviolence changed tonight? If so, how? Have your ideas about nonviolence changed tonight? If so, how? You have six minutes. One batch. Oh, 
the ones in my pocket were already. There are some that were in you answer. I am afraid I 
I, I am afraid. I am afraid I have to be, and now comes a good German word, the Spielverderber tonight. So the Spielverderber is the one who ends the game, who just says we can't. So the, when the fun is, is there, is the most, and everyone enjoys talking, um, he comes down with a hammer and says, that's it. Yeah, but we, are, um, we have a time uh, window, and that's the agreement uh, here. Then we have to end the, the event. So I'm sorry to be the one uh, to tell you this. Um, but I want to, before we close, um, I, I want to point out a few things. First of all, we have a table uh, with books. Um, and well, we didn't talk this through before, but I'm certain that our speaker is ready to sign the books we have in the back. Um, so if you want to purchase, um, um, books we have we have them in the back. Um, we also have a, a laptop, and we ask you if you want to leave us your name and your email, and then in the future we would. Um, well, we don't send out gazillions of emails, but um, maybe occasionally um, if we have events like this. And I should also uh, add that. Uh, together with the Interp uh, uh, Interfaith Working Group for Peace and the Nonviolence uh, non Project, we are thinking about turning this into not regular meetings, but thinking of this as a longer process during which we start talking about what are means of engagement, how we can come up with alternatives. So as I said in the beginning, um, open the space for these types of conversations. So a longer process, and if you leave us your email, we'll inform you um, when we uh, um, have another speaker or another event or um, uh, want to um, have these conversations again. Um, then um, I wrote down, and I actually did this already when I had the, um, and the pleasure to meet for lunch with our speaker, a force more powerful, um, the documentary, we heard about a number of books and, and documentaries, movies. So um, we kindly ask if you could provide us with a list of the resources you mentioned. Um, and then we can, on our website, make them available as, as, as resources and um, on, on, on other websites as well. Um, so on, on the website of the Interfaith um, uh, working group for peace. Um, and with that, um, I'm at the end. Um, I want to thank again everyone um, who made sure that um, um, this was success. Um, the audience um, and all those of you who came out to the Memorial Union today. Um, on Dean Olstadt. Paula Roggi, um, Professor Cohen, and of course our speaker, Dr. Maria. <laughs> Stefan, was that better? It's the, the, in German, the second syllable is long, so Stefan. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways, big hand for everyone. So thank you so much. Please, please leave your name and the books are over there. Um, safe travels back home. <laughs>